Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Um, good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, further evidence session of the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee uh, into our inquiry into disinformation and fake news. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome Aaron Banks and Andy Wigmore to give evidence to the committee this morning. I think it's worth noting for the record that although we've had a, we've had a sort of <laughs> bit of few ups and downs getting here, um, you've, you know, you've freely agreed to come and give evidence, uh, unlike some other people who tried to get in this inquiry and we've not had a summons you, you're, you know, you're here because you accepted the invitation of the committee and we're grateful for that. Um, I know, and in your correspondence on Friday, um, you referenced that you intended to lodge an appeal against the Electoral Commission's decision. I just wanted to check whether, and I think you expect to do that today. Yes, it's lodged at 10 a.m. That's so, fine. Yeah. Um, I, under the, I'm sure I still understand under the circumstances, and it's not particularly core to our inquiry anyway, but uh, as that's now really sub judice, we won't, we won't be asking you any questions about the Electoral Commission's investigation or, or your appeal, and that should be properly dealt with, dealt with separately, so it's not, not ground we're looking to cover. This morning. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. In light, Mr. Chairman, mm. of the fact that, um, according to Guido, that you had um, some hospitality from Putin's number one man mm. in the uh, United Kingdom, do you not think you're a bit conflicted quizzing us about this today? So I was wanted to make a suggestion. Perhaps you might want to recuse yourself and then let one of the other people take over as chairman. So resign, so you can actually ask us questions independently. <laughs> well, it's nice. It's a nice try. It's a nice try, Mr. Um Well, it's just. Uh, like, well, I, I mean, I, I, you may have better intel than me. I didn't know that. Roman Abramovich was Putin's number one man in London, but you may know more than I do. But, <laughs> but you know, all I can say is, you know, I, I got invited to the football. I didn't meet uh, the owner, and I wasn't. Offered, I wasn't offered Stalin's vodka or, um, or, uh, 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 or else, so I don't, I'm not as good at pushing their buttons but as you, you are. But, but, uh, but Damien, you do know the, how it looks, you know, that yeah. you, you have hospitality or you meet Russians and then people write terrible things about you. Know. Yeah, I know. But anyway, the, I just, just mentioned it. Well, yeah. there's also another issue, another issue that's very important. Well, no, I, I don't think we want to get too distracted before we No, I think, I, think let's, uh, I think let's start as we, meet, yeah. start as we need to go on. And uh, <laughs> what I can say is that I, I have declared uh, the Registered Member's interest my acceptance of two tickets to go and watch Chelsea play Crystal Palace. Uh, and I can say that there were no uh, inducements, offers, you know, uh, no shares in gold mines. Nothing was... Nothing transpired of that football match, which would give this inquiry any cause for concern. But, no, uh, no, no honey traps? No honey traps, no, right, no, no, nothing at all. It was all very... Uh, Chelsea won 2-1, and, uh, and that, was it. that was that was the extent of the entertainment. But, uh, OK, um, accepted. OK, so um, we've got to start off on the questioning, and um, I would like to start really on... Sorry, so I, I'd really want to declare my, my, my small interest that I did mention yeah. to you yeah. earlier. Um, that uh, at one point, this is an interest just to, to cover ourselves legally, that at one point you were going to stand against me in Clacton. Uh, and I so think it was for the day. It was we we, have, no, we yeah. have no connection yeah. apart from that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I don't think there are any other declarations of interest. Um, so we'll start the session. I wanted to start off really um, with, with, the, with the issues really that led us to initially inviting you to give evidence, and indeed actually you requesting to give evidence yes. during the session yes. with uh, Alexander Nix. So I just really wanted to just for the, for the benefit of the record and for the benefit of, the, of our inquiry, just to sort of cover off some of the questions around Cambridge Analytica, which I know you are obviously very familiar yeah. with. Um, Brittany Kaiser said to the committee that um, the initial introduction made uh, between, uh, to link you with Cambridge Analytica was made through Steve Bannon. Is that correct? The initial introduction was through Steve Bannon, yes. Yeah. And did, did you have a relationship with Steve Bannon before that time, or did, did he I reach out to you? I met Steve Bannon on two occasions. He was obviously uh, involved in Braveheart, yeah. and uh, knew Nigel Farage quite closely, and I met him twice in London, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and um, do you, I mean, Robert is obviously heavily connected with, yeah. um, with that organisation as well. Do you, is he someone that you know, have you met? I've never met uh, Robert Mercer. Okay, that's fine. He's a, he's a friend of Nigel's. Yeah. Do you remember when you, you had first contact with um, Cambridge Analytica? Do you remember how, when that was? I don't have the, ti the exact timeline, but I'm pretty sure the, the, the way it's been reported is correct. Yeah. So at some point, probably earlier in 2015, that would yeah. be correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and did you, I mean, at that time you were 
obviously thinking about um, the role Leave.eu would play in the referendum. Had you started thinking about the sorts of services Cambridge Analytica could supply, were you actively looking <coughs> for a company that could work with you to provide well, expertise it, on it, data analytics? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was proposed that they were experts in, as you say, data yeah. analytics, and we, we spoke to them. They made a pitch to us, and I think as the I know we're not allowed to talk about the electoral commission, but yeah. their their report I think shows no evidence that we went ahead with with the pitch, and that that's the case. Yeah. But was it your um, Intention to do so that if you'd been successful in securing the designation, that yeah. you would have you would have used them. Yeah, we put it into the designation document yeah. that went to the electoral commission yeah. as, as record. Yeah, and um, would you? There was some just, there was there was some talk about. I think believe Donald Cummings has written about this in his blog yeah. yesterday about. I don't uh, think you can believe everything, Mister. <laughs> no, no, no. Because no, no, I would say. So, what, what was it? he talked about? I believe the same blog he recommended. And I was thrown down a mine shaft, so I'm not really. No, exactly. He says some pretty old. He used gold mine shaft. Exactly. He said some comments about me as well, so <laughs> on his blog. But um, the. Got that in common, at least. Uh, but um, one of the things I want to ask about there was there was some talk. I think you and you, in fact, you <coughs> I think advocated whether yeah. Leave to the Human Vote Leave should become one organisation rather than two competing <coughs> organisations. Yeah. Ran, uh, in, uh, ran in the new year, twenty sixteen. Well, so I think there was a lot of heat around the fact there were two campaigns. Mm. A lot of donors, a lot of Conservative MPs, others thought that it would be better to try to have a united front. Mm. Actually, as it turns out, um, you know, for, I think it's fairly well on the record we did despise. Dominic Cummins, Matthew Elliott, and the other uh, people that tried to turn it into part of the Tory party. I mean, from our perspective, Vote Leave was a, a sort of an attempt to kind of own the referendum for, from a, the Tory Brexiteers' point of view and exclude UKIP and the other, you know, participants. So we were we were certainly not very friendly with that. Yeah, but you, you would have, um, uh, and one of the things that Dominic Cummings cites is that. Um, he disagreed with your use of Facebook data the way you were using Facebook data. Presumably that was the model that had been proposed by Cambridge Analytica. Well, no, I mean, we built up a huge social media following, uh, both on Facebook and um, Twitter. I think over a million people followed us. We had huge engagement. But that was internally generated. We did not use Cambridge Analytica. And it's quite interesting, actually, if you look at, go to Dominic Cummins mm. and Tim Shipman's definitive uh, work on the referendum. Um, he actually says that Dan Hannan said that Vote Leave scraped uh, Google data and sent it to a team of astrophysicists on the West Coast. Hmm. I mean, I think this is just demonstrable nonsense. So I think there's a lot of myth around some of these things, and that's one of my big issues with hmm. some of the output of the, the committee taking witnesses uh, and the evidence given, and then it turns into almost fact. I mean, you, you mentioned Brittany Kaiser at the mm. beginning of that. She's now subsequently said that she was sent by Cambridge Analytica to see Julian Assange. Mm. She was uh, sent there to um, give them, I think, cryptocurrency to uh, hand on to WikiLeaks. So what, what we would maintain is a number of these kind of key honest whistleblowers that were put in front of the committee, the decent, upstanding employees that were going to you know, change the world by telling the mm. truth, You've got her saying she went to see Julian Assange. You've got Chris Wiley, the other guy, has recently come out and said he's been in receipts of our stolen emails that appeared in the Sunday Times mm. for three months, and that this evidence has, you know, been sent to U.S. intelligence and British intelligence. If you see it from our point of view, yeah, there's been a whole inquiry into Cambridge Analytica, which has led on to an electoral commission investigation, onto an ICO investigation. And it's been conflated from two witnesses that, frankly, you know, the credibility of them is shot to pieces. I mean, Brittany Kaiser held a press conference the day after appearing at this committee to launch her own business called Rest in Peace Data Theft. So you can see it from our point of view. These are not particularly credible witnesses, but they've been, you know, cloaked in a sort of, you know, these were great whistleblowers. The Guardian have written fabulous stories off the back of all this, and in fact, you know. The Walter Mitty time characters. Well, but that's a, so. I'm sorry, but that's I'm just. Well, that, but this, you're entitled. You're entitled to your yeah. point of view, and, and yeah. part of the reason and for thank you, by the way, for letting me express that. I think yeah. it's useful. We can talk about these things. But, but, the, but part of the reason for inviting yeah. people yeah. like yourselves to come and give evidence is that so that you can 
as part of our inquiry, we can yeah. put to you uh, question, yeah. issues that, have, that we've received and give For you sure. the chance to, to respond to them, which is what we're, we're looking to do today. I, can you see well, what I, I'm I, saying? I can see, what, see yeah. what you're saying, and obviously for us, you know, because Brittany Kaiser was someone that was you know, shared a platform with Leave.eu yeah. at the launch and was working directly on the campaign. It's obviously of interest to us when allegations are made about that to talk to some of the people that were actually doing that work and hear what they have to say. But, in, but obviously we want to hear your views on that as well. well I, I just merely say that subsequent to their appearance, their credibility is somewhat shot to pieces by the somewhat fantastical statements they've made afterwards. They enjoyed their time in the limelight. Yeah. And they've obviously, you know, well, conflated quite a lot from it. So obviously that, that's your view and you're, you've expressed it and, and yeah. you're entitled to it. Um, but do you, when did you first start discussing with the Cambridge Analytica team the way in which you could use data held by your insurance company to create data we had a We had two, two or three meetings with them and it became clear to me that, um, as is true in a lot of politics, there's a lot of sizzle and sometimes not a lot of substance. So it became clear that what this company really is as an advertising agency, which I think is what Nick's actually said, that then did a little bit of politics on the side. And we became increasingly concerned that their um, services they were offering were just well, that, an, an mm -hmm. advertising agency. It's worth noting that you know, when you market an, uh, an insurance company, by the way, the insurance company and Cambridge Analytica were never discussed the same things. We never involved insurance company in Cambridge Analytica ever. But when you're, when you're an insurance company, it's marketing. So if you take a look at how marketing works, you're talking about pay-per-click, Google Ads, all these kind of mechanisms that you use to market insurance products. We were very skilled at that. We've got years of understanding of that. All we did was apply that knowledge in marketing for insurance to the referendum initially, to the campaign, because that's all we knew. Hmm. What we decided to do is try and go, out, go and find the best people we possibly could in the world. So we, we, we um, looked at an organisation called Goddard Gunster, which I think you're familiar with, yeah. in the United States. All they do is referenda, that's hmm. all they do. And here, we believed that Cambridge Analytica were perceived certainly as one of the best campaigning companies, political campaigning companies. So of course we looked at them. Hmm. The truth is, our marketing people and the people we had around us probably knew more than they did when it comes to actually trying to get the, that message across. They're skilled in insurance marketing. We, we took that knowledge, which we both deeply held, and applied it to the campaign. I think you, you know, go back to what you said about the mm. two campaigns. I think we actually won the referendum because there were two campaigns. Mm. The, the vote leave was a kind of soft Tory appeal to the kind of middle class kind of voters. We were very much appealing to more the sort of Labour voters um, where immigration was a big issue. Yeah. So I think in the end, maintaining two campaigns was you know, a very valuable yeah. thing. Could you ask, when, when, you, when you were discussing with Cam, yeah. Cambridge Analytica, all the work we've done looking at the way they work so far, Obviously, Aggregate IQ have been one yeah. of their key partners. They've worked with them consistently, really, from the end of, from the beginning of 2014 yeah. um, through to the start of the regulated period for um, the referendum itself. Had had they discussed bringing AIQ in to work with them on the campaign if they if they were applied by you? It's not something I had heard of. Me neither. But did they, obviously the, the key service that AIQ provided, they created <coughs> various tools that help take the different data elements and can turn them into the data sets that can I be used for targeting. And that would seem to be a skill that Cambridge Analytica bought in from them and therefore I wondered who would have, who would have done I, that if they'd worked for I think that was very much my point on Alex yeah. and Nick's, that I think they were huge marketing people that claimed to do all sorts of things, mm -hmm. but actually what they were on that age. But so, you know, it's not, not uncommon, is it, for, for people that offer these kind of services to, and I think, as we saw with the Channel 4 expose, you know, he made all sorts of, you know, claims, you know, of what his company could do. Mm -hmm. Whether it actually transpired he did or not, I don't know. So but I got the definite feeling that they were a kind of ad agency that kind of, had surrounded this mystique around. Hmm. You see, this idea that you can hypnotise people is rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. But what about the role, obviously, key part of the way they work seems to be psychographics. And Anton Denix has spoken you know, throughout 2016 at various conferences and afterwards about psychographics being one of the additional things that they bring and also their ability to analyse and. So, psychological profiling. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, was, was that something that. Because obviously, you've got data, I mean, you've got insurance data, mm -hmm. you've got data you can work with. 
But did he we talk? We never used insurance data. It's nothing to do with insurance data. We never touched insurance data. Okay. But what I but what I will say is that we had a, a, a team of people that worked specifically on creative uh, advertising. I'm sure you're all familiar with some of our work. Some people may not like it, but in terms of the actual stuff we were putting out, we did our own sort of micro messaging, if you liked. I mean, I'll give you an example. We put out a a tile that was targeted at green voters, which is not something you would think would have any traction. Mm. But then we looked at, let's say, for instance, you know, poor African countries that can't export their goods into the UK. And so what we would do is target individual groups. So we did that, mm. but we didn't use this kind of, you know, uh, mythical data to do it. What was on the on the um, the pitch doc on the sort of phase one document yeah. that, they, that, that, was, that was published, um, that Britney published, but that. There are sort of three core elements to that. There is, there is UK. Sorry, um, I don't know who took the photograph, but just we had this problem last week. Just to say that no photographs are allowed to be taken in the room. So hopefully that went off by accident. But uh, we make sure there are no other photographs taken. Um, there are three uh, elements in that phase one document. Uh, there is um, there is inf there's information coming yep. from UKIP. Uh, there's there's data that's been gathered by Leave.eu. Yep. There's also then uh, information from Eldon Insurance. So what was the what was the, in, in their presentation to you? Yeah. What were they suggesting you so did? I think, yeah. So I think the, the sequence. Uh, <coughs> uh, Sorry. Yes. Fine. So I think the sequence of events there was I went to the meeting and I, I wore several different hats. Mm. Because I, you don't disconnect your different businesses and the things you're doing. You really don't. Mm. So effectively what happened was when they started talking about how you psychologically profile, how you, you know, look for a niche kind of customer, immediately in my head the kind of you know, process you know, insurance is all about how do you target your product to the person you want to target mm. to. And so the, the three things that were of interest to me were obviously the referendum campaign, my insurance business, could, could they offer services that you know, were along those sort of lines, and thirdly, with the UKIP hat on, would it be a useful you know, messaging tool for UKIP? And I see no, con I, I can see why you would think there would be a conflict, but actually there really isn't. Well, I suppose the, it's one of the things that, depending on how you manage that situation, there could be a conflict. That's, that's, yes. that's, 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 that's why the question well, it's arises. It's important to manage conflicts, yeah. you know. Yeah. The, and, and, to, yeah. and to separate those different yeah. roles, because clearly it, it would be a matter of interest if in company insurance, insurance yeah. data was being used for political yeah. targeting. That exactly. Yeah. But the, the, the point I'm making is that we're now sitting around the committee with a lot of hindsight here. Mm. I mean, we were just having a casual conversation with this company. And then they almost came back and said, well, these are the three areas we can look at. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, we've got to be very careful that, you know, in, in examining all this, we don't jump from one conclusion that you had a discussion about it to it happened. You know, because all three of the things you've talked about didn't happen. And it's a bit, you know, it's a bit like even with the gold mine stuff, which yeah. I'm sure we're going to come on to. There's a definition between having a meeting with somebody, passing it on to someone, and it not going anywhere, are we really saying that we can't have a conversation, you know, and then it has to be, a, this is the whole Guardian thing, that if I meet you for a glass of wine, there must be some dreadful conspiracy. Or if you go to a football yeah, match. or a football match, but there's been no actual definitive evidence of anything. Well, that's but one shred of evidence, so that's the thing that I yeah. find frustrating. Well, that, that's why, that's why yeah. I, I chose my most carefully in asking the question, asking about what they pitched to you, what they proposed, yeah. not necessarily, yeah, and asking you to clarify that there, situation. If you were them, Mr Chairman, you, 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 know, you had an opportunity, and, and remember the, and the timing of this as well, the referendum hadn't even been called. Mm -hmm. Everyone was still thinking, is it going to happen? Is Cameron going to come back with the deal? No one really knew. So when you were a company like them, you're pitching to a businessman, you're thinking, what, what can I get out of him? Yes, there's a referendum, there's possibly work for his insurance company. So from their perspective, well, look, you could see why they were. You know, I understand you worked for Saatchi and Saatchi. I'm sure you made plenty of spectacular pitches to clients on how to give the services of hmm. Saatchi and Saatchi. I mean, that's how business works. It's a simpler time. Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably more enjoyable time. Than that. Um, but, but, but obviously, the, where they pitched it to you was, they, yeah. well, they said their document, came to Cambridge believes that the integration of several different projects will reduce costs. So when they're talking about integration of projects, are they looking at, um, there, there are three potential strands of work, 
uh, which can be managed separately, but 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 by one team, or are they saying these could actually you have three projects that could become one project? And I think anyone involved in politics knows it all starts getting very confusing very quickly. I mean, from our point of view, what we've said is we've had some initial discussions with Cambridge Analytica. We didn't take up their services, so I'm struggling a bit to the line of questioning because we didn't go ahead with these things. Yeah. Why did you take such great exception to what Alexander Nix said when he first appeared in front of the committee about, about his relationship to you? To your company? Uh, to your, your, your I don't, company. You know, I, I felt a bit sorry for him on the, the, the uh, second outing, I have to say. But I, I think... Well, on the first outing, I mean, you were quite... Well, just remind me again of what he said, if you could... Well, I mean, because we, we, asked, him, we asked him about the fact that, um, you know, you'd... Um, Andy Wigmore, you'd said that uh, on Twitter that you know, that you'd um, that you'd brought in Cambridge Analytica to work, yeah. uh, how and what a good sort of basically what a good decision that had been. Yeah. Um, you talk about it in Bad, Bad Boys of Brexit as well yeah. about bringing in you know, yeah. hiring Cambridge Analytica. Um, you clarified what you meant by that, but but yeah. he he was when he 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 was seemed very keen to distance himself completely from. Um, sure. That period, though, yeah. those, those, and you seem to take considerable exception to that. Well, I think I think one thing that, that is clear is when you're telling the truth, it's much easier to tell it than trying to torture yourself into all sorts of, you know, knots. And one of the one of the issues I had with them was at one point the, the, the verbal offer they made, you know, to say, well, we'll if you pay us a million pounds up front, we'll raise five million. And it struck me at that time. That's when really it clicked that it was a bit of a fraud and I think subsequent conversations and discussions you've had with that show a lot of that as well. You know, I think he himself did he not say that you know he made stuff up you know in front of clients and, and, and lied I think he said actually was he? Did he say he lied? He said he lied yeah. Well okay he yeah. lied but so that I think for me was a strong indication that this was an ad agency that basically was just overplaying its hand. And so that's probably why I was pretty angry with him. But subsequently, I felt a little sorry for him in the second meeting. Okay. Chris Matheson. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Gentlemen, good morning. Um, when Cambridge Analytica was pitching to you, did you give Cambridge Analytica any, any data? The only data that was ever sent to Cambridge Analytica was some UKIP data uh, from them because they wanted to do an exercise uh, uh, from Cambridge Analytica. And I understand that they did some initial scaping work. They then whacked in a bill for £39,000, I think, for 41500 How much? 41500 In fact. <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> they, whacked in, they whacked in the invoice anyway, go on. I don't, you know, whether the invoice is 39000 or 41000 doesn't seem to me neither here nor there. Um, it's an irrelevance. So, but the point is, they put this invoice in, which UKIP said, no, you're meant to be doing a scoping exercise. I think they approached me to pay it, and I said, not in your life. Did you give UKIP any data? Sorry? Did, did you give UKIP any data? No, that was UKIP data they sent. Can I, and because um, obviously, Mr Banks, you, you um, made your name in a sense as, um, through UKIP as being uh, a big UKIP donor. Yeah. That's how you, you, you came to public prominence. Um, how do you sort of demarcate your role within UKIP at that time as opposed to your role as it became with Leave.eu? I never had a role in UKIP. Some of them didn't like you very much, did they? I think most of them didn't like you <laughs> very much. I mean, we, we wanted to try and professionalise the party. That was uh, something that was going to prove extremely difficult to do. So I don't. I had no role within UKIP. But you were, but you were a donor to them? Yes. Other than being yeah. a donor? Yeah. Did, did you ever talk, you know, sit down and discuss strategy with them? Oh, well, you know, Nigel, we talk strategy all the time. Mm. So let me just follow on then. From is it, do, do politicians not do that? I would hope so. Yeah, yeah. I would hope so. I, would hope, I mean, sometimes the strategy worked spectacularly, sometimes it, it didn't, really. Um, so let me just, because we've had several explanations over this, yeah. this uh, relationship with um, Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. Um, so I think Mr. Banks, you tweeted. Well, originally we said we on, on October in the book we said we've hired Cambridge Analytica as the chairman. Yeah. Just referred to. Yeah. Um, well, we did, the, to, to clarify that, what had happened was we did put them into the designation document mm. for the Go movement. So it, I, I know this gets horrendously complex, but you started off with the No campaign, and then the the referendum people changed the name of the referendum 
and <laughs> leave to remain. So the name no.eu had to go. Then it became leave.eu. And then effectively um, we teamed up with a number of other campaign groups to put in an application for the Go movement. Mm. So when we said we hired Cambridge Analytica, maybe that was, you know, a better choice of words could have been deployed there. The fact was, we didn't hide it, we put it in the designation document and said if we win the designation doc, you know, we will use Cambridge Analytica. Mm. Now, did we hire them? Clearly not, because we didn't, you know, pay them all and sign a contract. Right. So, so I would agree that that choice of word would have, could have been better. Um, I think you treated Mr Banks, we yep. made no secret of using Cambridge Analytica, we created a huge social media, artificial intelligence, won it for leave, yep. that was in January of... Um, I think, Mr Wigmore, you then told the Observer they, Cambridge Analytica, were happy to help because Nigel is a good friend of the Mercers and Mercer introduced them to us. He said, is this company we think may be useful to you? What they were trying to do in the US and what we were trying to do, what we were trying to do had massive parallels. Well, I think Mercer and Bannon were obviously very close. Hmm. We hmm. did meet Bannon, we made no secret of that. I know, we never met Mercer. Right. So then, then we then move on. To, then the, the next the, the relationship with Cambridge Analytica was then again. Mr. I think this is you, Mr. Wigmore. Cambridge Analytica did no work for us formally, and if they had, it would have been way before you had to report expenditure. I think that's what you were yeah. getting at before. We never employed Cambridge Analytica, and they never gave us anything in kind. And then we have Cambridge Analytica provided initial help and guidance to the Leave.EU campaign, which then went on to develop its own artificial intelligence and analysis methodology. The AMI, AI machine learning was developed in Bristol by 20 mathematicians and actuaries with input from Cambridge Analytica at the very beginning and then executed by Goddard Gunster. And now we've got to the point where Cambridge Analytica is simply an ad agency. It is. Um, in, in the words of who wants to be a millionaire, is that, is that your final answer? <laughs> <laughs> or is it, is it, Can I phone a friend? Right, very good. So are we, are we, are we, are we, are we, is this now the definitive version of your... I think... I, go on, Andy. Go well, on. I think... Um, to be honest, it, I, there's probably a bit of boastfulness. Um, I'm an agent provocateur, my job is to spin. Um, you're familiar with all that. And so I, I would be guilty of being provocative, an agent provocateur, slight exaggerating in the message quite often. Um, and I'm guilty of doing that, absolutely. But, but the, the truth is, and the reality is, what the me mechanics of actually what happened, we put out in a document, it wasn't something that we were trying to hide, you could have read it. The, you know, did we use Cambridge Analytica for the pitch? Absolutely. Did they do some work to get to that pitch? Of course they did. They had to, because if we had won, it wouldn't be kind of like right now plan. They had to do a certain amount of planning just in case we won. So there's a lot of that groundwork which had to have, take place. That's just and, a reality. And did well, I think, use a, I think sorry. sorry, using the agent, agent for Coutin, we were a disruptive uh, oh. campaign. And we certainly weren't above leading journalists up the country path, making fun of them. Uh, same with politicians. No, in some way, in same way, I refer back to if you do manage to get Dominic coming to the stand uh, eventually, you know, the idea that there were astrophysicists in California, you know, working in some skunk works, you know, for vote leave, scraping Google data is fantastical. And that's something that Dan Hannon said. So I think, you know, you have to take a slight pinch of salt because we were running a campaign deliberately. In, you know, aimed at you know, making fun of people, pushing them in we, certain directions. We were you know, we were outside. When we started, I mean, I think our first our first lunch with was Mr. Picard there, and he will tell you he had a clue who we were. No one had a clue who we were, apart from perhaps that Mr. Banks had given a lot of money to Nigel Farage and UKIP, but to try and get a share of voice and try and create a movement and try and create a noise. You have to do certain things to get attention. And, and, so, and in the context of this inquiry, does that include um, uh, perhaps using fake news to shake people up? What's, what, what's fake news? Well, well what, what, uh, every politician, uh, with great respect, every politician uses the best placed you know, position of a situation right. to try and great, create the best environment for someone to write about it. If that's fake news, then that's what we do. But fake news is, it can come in many forms if you want to examine it like that. I, mean, I, could, I, I would say, Chris, that... 
that Parliament itself is the biggest source of fake news in the entire country. Well, I, I, hope, straight, I, hope straight, did, I hope I could disagree straight, with you on that one. But straight, uh, straight, after this, yeah. straight after this meeting, you'll be at lunch with some Guardian journalist coughing a <laughs> glass of Chablis <laughs> and spinning it the way you want to spin yeah. it. If, uh, if, only, if, only that was, if only that was the case. Did Goddard Gunster put any of the data that had been processed by yeah, and Goddard Gunster don't do data. What they, what the, how they operate is to work out what is the best way of placing messages in certain places. That's not about data, that's much more about marketing and, and, and looking at data, analysing data which you'd have to hand to them. That's how they operate. And the yeah. United States is very different <coughs> because of just the way that, that campaigns work and what you can do with negative advertising, positive advertising, do all of that. I think I want to, I mean, I mean the, uh, you know, if I look at it for, from our perspective when we first started the campaign, we look at all of the advantage the Remain campaign had. They outspent us two to one, they had the civil, civil service working for them, they sent a leaflet to everybody in the country, they had they got the IMF, they got President Obama, they, they had the government working, they had every possible advantage to win this referendum. They ran a lousy campaign threatening people and when we started our campaign we realised to get a share of the voice that what we had to do was be slightly alternative but tease journalists. You know, I mean, they're the cleverest, stupidest people on earth. Because actually, they're clever, but also, they really want to believe some of this stuff. So we're, we were not above, uh, you know, using alternative methods to sort of punch home our message or lead people up the garden path if we had to. But also, we, the piece of advice we got right from the beginning was, remember, this is, referendum are not fa about facts, it's about emotion. You've got to tap into that emotion. It doesn't matter how many facts you throw at it, it's white noise to people because people are voting on something they believe and feel emotionally. Who gave you that advice? Goddard Gunster. Right. They had run a successful referendum right across the United they States. They had a 93% uh, hit rate in America. Can you I know, I if you go back to what I was saying, when you had the emergency austerity budget, everyone will be £4,000 worse off. There'll be half a million job losses on the day the referendum starts. I mean, actually, if you think about it, um, the, the Leave campaign was outgunned in every possible way. You had the battleship of a campaign, but you chose the wrong strategy. And the reason you did that was you didn't understand the underlying issues that were driving the Brexit referendum. And I think when, when you look at it, I think we did understand the issues better, and therefore we tailored our campaign to to uh, achieve those goals. Well, let me just ask you one more question. And we talked yeah. about these astrophysicists in, um, in California. Tim Shipman does, yeah. Oh, yeah. But you <laughs> talk about uh, Bristol. You have 20 mathematicians and actuaries. Who were yeah. they? Um, where, where, when, well, where I think it's slightly, slightly conflated that we do have an artificial intelligence team and big data analytics working on our insurance business. But none of them were deployed in the, uh, in, in the referendum campaign. <laughs> so... so the where actuaries, um, sorry, I think it was Mr. Wigmore, the, <coughs> uh, the, the AI ma machine learning was developed in Bristol by 20 mathematicians act and, and actuaries with input from Cambridge Analytica. Those well, are from your, those are from your insurance. I think the words of Alexander Litnick, he probably spun it. Slight exaggeration. I know how the insurance operate, uh, country, company operates. But if my numbers are incorrect, there might have been 15. But we, they, do have, they do have people that look at this stuff. You have to as well. So, so were these but they were not connected with the insurance business, uh, the referendum whatsoever. Where did you get them from? Where well, they work them? for the insurance business. But they, no, they, no, they, no, hold on. You're, sorry. Hang on. They, we, they, we weren't, they weren't. They, right, no, hang, hang on. on. Fellas, hang on. Yeah. Gentlemen, sorry. Yeah. Either, they Fellas is all right. <laughs> Gen <laughs> either they were working for the insurance business or they went or they went connected to the insurance clear. company but you can't have both i'm just saying that there was not people on artificial intelligence and big data analytics working on the referendum it was conflated hmm. in the same way that Dan Hannon said that they had astrophysicists working in, you know, on the west coast of California. So were these these uh, were these actuaries employed by the insurance business they didn't work on the referendum that's what I, I can't I don't know how how I can yeah. plainly put it so, okay, so what this, what Mr. Whitmore said here, we developed in Bristol by 20 mathematicians actuaries, isn't it actually? No, correct. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Rebecca Powell. Thank you very much. Apologies, Chairman, for coming in late, and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming to the committee. Uh, I wanted to just look at some of your myriad businesses, Mr. Banks. So, yeah. 
For anyone on the outside, this would be uh, yeah. This is this is a, a complicated arrangement of mm. business, and you have indeed, I believe, many names <coughs> as well. Uh, I wonder if you might uh, just start off by uh, explaining your role with IS, ICS Risk Solutions. It's a holding company that owns an insurance business. So is it uh, the heart of your, your finances? I think, by the way, I've got to, many different Yeah, companies. I have to say, first of all, I've got international businesses. Yeah. I do have quite a complex business structure. And I know that's difficult for some MPs to perhaps you know, grasp the complexity of you know, a financial uh, group of companies and how it interacts. But the facts of the matter are, you know, it's a bit, quite a big insurance business. It employs over a thousand people. You're if talking you about went, Go Skippy. No, hold on. You're, 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 hold on. Yeah. <laughs> if you went into the accounts of Aviva or any insurance company in this country, you would, could equally say this is a complex web of subsidiaries and different companies. It's an insurance business, and by definition, insurance businesses have lots of connected companies. Okay, so just to, just to be clear yeah. then, for us MPs who don't understand you know, yeah. the complexities of 20 businesses, yeah. could you just stick clearly out? <laughs> um, I did run my own business, but it was very small. Uh, What's your I, business? ICS um, <laughs> Communications yeah. and PR. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, of course it was. I C- <laughs> I C- I C- Did you work with Mr Collins? ICS uh, Risk Solutions. Can you just explain where that comes in, though? Is it the holding company for Eldon Insurance um, and the insurer behind Go Skippy, just so that we've got that all clear? Um, off the top of my head, we've got a number of ICSs. There's more than one ICS. You'd have to be very specific, and I'd have to go back and check. I mean, even to the point where... If you said to me, do you know every single company and how it interacts with every single company, it's probably unlikely I can tell you that. But um, um, ICS, if it's the right ICS, is the ultimate uh, holding company of Eldon Insurance, which is the Ghost Skippy, is one of the brands that operates under Eldon Insurance. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, is it true that ICS Risk Solutions paid over £77 million mm-hmm. since 2015 to prop up another of your companies called Southern Rock, mm-hmm. which is you say, um, an underwriting arm in Gibraltar? So you're saying... Well, I'm I, just asking you. Well, I know, I just want to I clarify... Just to be the, clear. Well, I just want to be clear. So you're saying a company I, call, I own called ICS is propping up another company I own this is what we're led to believe. I've just but I own both this companies. Is true. So yes, but I believe that Southern Rock uh, was insolvent. So you've been probably well, that's up not correct. With How seventy-seven that million. How'd you work that one out? <laughs> if it was insolvent, it wouldn't I'm be allowed to you. trade, would it? This is a good question. That's what I'm asking. But this well, is what we're question. led to believe. Well, it's a ridiculous question. I mean, actually, if an insurance company is insolvent, it loses its license, it can't trade. Instantly. Instantly. So what you're really saying is that ICS Holdings, which I own, lent some money to another company I own. I, I mean, I that what you're to saying? that it was after regulators found that that business was trading while technically insolvent. Well, the regulators, put in, we put in place with the regulators a, what's called a restoration plan. It's quite normal insurance. I mean, Aviva and Direct Line in the same year announced £1 billion losses in the UK motor market. We were asked, or not asked, we were required to put more capital into the insurance business, along with the entire UK insurance industry, by the way, had to all put money into their insurance companies, and that money came from another company I owned. So I'm really, I'm struggling to see what the killer question is here. Oh, well, it's not supposed to be a killer question. Well, I mean, is, I'm just trying it? to get some clarity, but also then, um, the company's house yeah. um, have asked um, you yeah. to publish the accounts of, of ICS Risk Solutions, have they not, in order to get some clarity on all of these No, things? they haven't asked us to. Oh. I've not, I mean, if you're giving me new information that I haven't hitherto received, I don't know, but I, I, we have not been asked to do that. Okay. Uh, and then... And by the um, way, we file all of our accounts with all of the different company, you know, uh, registrations. Of course we do. We're a licensed insurance company. Fine. 
Thank you. Uh, Can I just, also, sorry, just return to the point of the sort of you know seventy seven million into the, into uh, Southern Rock. It, it was money that went from one company owned to another company owned. So if you look at someone like Aviva, you look at someone like a Direct Line, they would have had a subsidiary that trades. And because of a widespread m losses in the UK motor market, virtually every UK insurance company had to put more capital into their insurance companies. Okay. Just, just I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. Just, just yeah. for the reasons, and the answer to the question seems to be there was a, yeah. there was a, a payment from the balance sheet of one company to, a, to yeah. the other. Yeah. yeah. And for that amount of money, there was, is that the second? Correct. Yeah. 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 No, I think you obviously yeah. just where did the £77 million come from? So I'll answer that for you before you get to the question, oh, if yeah. that is the question. Yeah. Well, you tell me. I'm assuming yeah. it came from ICS with Solutions, but maybe it came from somewhere else. <laughs> We'll get to that in a minute. Gold mines. We haven't got to rush no, 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 no. So, 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 effect, so effectively, the uh, the deal that was done. In fact, you, when you mentioned it went from one balance sheet to another, in fact, the deal was that the insurance uh, broker at the end of the uh, that transaction, Eldon, actually uh, sold some of its forward income on the sale of policies back to the insurance company. So there wasn't seventy-seven million pounds of cash that just went. Bosh into a bucket. It was a structured deal over four years where the income was paid in, you know, month by month in accordance with the deal we did with the regulator. So there was no uh, lump sum payment of £77 million going in. Okay. Uh, can we just move on to um, a company called Rock Services Limited? Yep. Can you just explain what, what, what that involvement is and where that comes from? Um, Rock Services is a UK. Um, <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> Rock Services is a UK uh, company which uh, provides a treasury facility around the group. It does what? It provides a, a treasury service to various oh, different funding. Things. To people. This is where it's yeah. where a lot of misunderstanding has come in. For instance, the Guardian gloriously wrote an article saying that uh, we had a turnover of twenty one million and administrative expenses of 19.8 million, well actually that was the payroll. So it actually settles group-wide all of the salaries every month, uh, it pays reinsurers, it pays a whole host of suppliers. It's a kind of service company that does, sort of settles bills if you like. Okay, and did, did it settle bills or give money or loans to Better for the Country Limited, which I well, believe is another of your companies? Yeah, this is disclosed in the Electoral Commission filing. So, you know, when uh, Bed of the Country, we lent money across to it, the Rock Services lent, uh, sorry, I lent the money to the company, but the money was delivered by Rock Services. So, but Rock Services weren't identified as a loan provider on Levy U's return to the Electoral uh, well, Commission you, because you, may, you chose to do it through Better for the Country. I think you may have missed the Chairman's opening uh, comments because we obviously don't approve of the Electoral Commission interpretation. Uh, interpretation of all of this and at, at nine o'clock today we filed an, uh, an appeal in the courts against all of the findings of the Electoral Commission. Um, so we're, we're straining into territory I that's... Uh, Back one here at the very yes, beginning because, um, because, the, because of the appeal that's been lodged, um, those matters really are considered sub so we're not going to pursue questions on, on that area. Okay. Um, so... And just can you just explain to me why do you, why am I allowed to ask this then? It, 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 because of the court, why why did you transfer money from Rock Services to Better for the Country, or, or we're not yeah. able to go into those? Because yeah, no, I, I, I'm actually will co I will cover it. Although it's been far obviously our appeal against the Electoral Commission findings have, have been lodged today. Effectively, the loan agreement between. Um, Better for the country and was between Better for the country and myself. Okay, Rock Services, as we just dis discussed, is a treasury function that just delivers, you know, the cash. It's just a service company, and the actual loan came from another one of my companies um, that was delivered in. So, from my perspective, I'm a UK taxpayer. Um, I've made the the loan out of my own funds or company funds to better for the country, and that is what was disclosed to the Electoral Commission. Now they say in their actual f finding that the loan 
I wasn't wholly untransparent. Well, actually, if you take the opposite of what is not wholly untransparent, it means, well, it was transparent. So they say that I should have said that the money came from Rock Services, whereas I, it said it came from me. Now, I'm sorry, but usually the other way around is people trying to hide behind companies, not, you know, say who it is. This is where the money came from. But I, I, can I just say, I, don't, I, think, I think because of the legal action that's now got, and this is part of the legal action of the Electoral Commission, um, all of the documents are available, or should be, you know, shortly, in our submission to the, the court, where we're basically challenging the fairness of that, that hearing. Or that those findings. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll probably leave it leave it there on, yeah, on that. Yeah. That's a bit for now. So. Okay. Were there any other questions? Yeah. Um, well, it was just a general observation that um, all these different companies yeah. and names and yeah. tortuously complicated arrangements that people now seem to be trying to unravel journalists or whoever suggest that you know you do have something to hide in all of this that might somehow well, uh, have some connection to influencing yeah. politics at, uh, across the world. <laughs> well, I like to think I'm an evil genius with a white cat that kind of controls the whole of Western democracy, but clearly that's nonsense. And by the way, you keep mentioning different names. I mean, this is another Guardian wonderful piece of uh, fake news where they've been through every filing that's been made to Company House. And uh, Company House, by the way, frequently made mistakes, so I know to my cost. And so what the Guardian said was, You've a, you've a, you, that there are seven different versions of Aaron Banks, you know, at Company's House. And the most common misspelling is two A's, you know, Aaron and Aaron. And so when you say different names, it's my name. It's not like John Smith or Roger or Brendan O'Hara. It's literally my name on the, on the documentation. So I can't see where, the, where this comes from. You know, it just says Aaron Banks, or in one case it uses my middle name. It says Aaron Fraser Banks, or it uses Aaron Fraser Andrew Banks. And each one is counted as a, as a separate version of my name. Now you just brought it up, because that is exactly how fake news works. You, say, you make a comment, you say, you use seven different versions at Company's House. Well actually, it was just different versions of my name or my middle name. And by doing that, the Guardian write the story, he doesn't file his paperwork correctly, he does this, and then they write the story, then the fake news gathers pace. And you've, you've actually repeated that, I think, two or three times. It's a complete non-story. Well, this is why you're here today, so that you can give your side. Well, I jolly well am. Uh, and right. just, just, just finally, so can you be quite clear that any money from your overseas business interests um, has never formed part of your political donations? No. You can't be clear. I can be clear. I, can be I live clear. in South Gloucestershire. I pay my taxes in South Gloucestershire. And I pay a, sh a shed load of tax. Probably more than the entire committee put together. Like, I'm not going to be lectured about my business interests. and uh, I structure everything legally. If you don't like the tax law pertaining to this country, get out there and change it. I would support that in many ways. I mean, you can change the tax for Google, change it for Starbucks, change it for every, all these different structures. But don't lecture me about offshore tax structures and complexities. You set the law. You make the law. And are you quite clear about what sources of finance are permitted uh, to, in order to donate to political parties or campaigns? I'm crystal clear. So we won't find anything untoward? You're, if you, I mean... No. And I'm frankly sick and tired of this. I mean, I, the reason I went into the referendum was because I have a different version of what the future of this country is. I respect your right to disagree with that. I know that you're all Remainers, I think. All Remainers? Hands up? Yeah, I think so. You've got a vested interest in trying to discredit the Brexit campaign. I mean, I look at the fact that you haven't called any witnesses from the Remain campaign to hammer them. I mean, I sit here, we've got George Osborne, he's editor of the Daily, you know, the Evening Standard. He, if, you, if you didn't have lunch with the, or go to the hospitality of the Putin's first man in Russia, he's certainly working for Putin's second man. 
This is the guy that ran the campaign. Yeah, Britain strong in Europe or Conservatives yeah. in Europe, then we would be equally asking them the same questions. But the guy leading the Remain, ca Remain campaign is working for a Putin oligarch in London. If you can't see that there's some double standards being applied here, I don't know. Ian Lucas. Mr. Bank. That's where we have to leave our live coverage from the select committee rooms. You can continue watching the session online on our website at bbc.co.uk slash parliaments.